Uh, this is the track Debating Traditionally. It's uh, three days. Why you signed up for three days of this torture, I don't know, but we'll see. There are three parts to this. Today we're going to talk about the fundamentals of lay debate and how to improve those. Uh, the tomorrow we'll talk about affirming, and the day after that we'll talk about negating. So to start off uh, in a debate or in a track about debating traditionally, uh, the question is, what is traditional debate? It is not for me to answer, it is for you. Yes? It's a debate where people run, like, don't run critical arguments, less philosophical arguments, and speak a lot slower. So let's not categorize traditional debate merely as an antithesis to what circuit debate is. What are some constitutive or inherent features about traditional debate other than that it is not circuit debate? Right. So, because traditional debate came first. We, we don't want to define this merely in opposition to something else. I think that sort of ignores that there are some unique things about traditional debate that we have to focus on, and that is the only way that we can effectively, you know, learn how to improve at traditional debate. I assume you are uh, Arjun? Yeah. Okay. So, wh what do you think are features that are constitutive? Yeah. So framework clash, so clash about value criterions. Okay, I think that's one part that might be constitutive of traditional debate. What else? This is gonna be a long three days if you all don't speak up. Like more persuasive speeches. So yeah. Like actually putting a lot of inflection into your words. So persuasive speaking, value criterion clash, get two more things and we'll call it good. The contentions more like grouping them together versus the line by line of circuit debate. I'm not really sure if that's entirely true. Uh, I think there's a tendency for people to do that. I don't know if that is a constitutive or inherent feature of traditional debate. Because um, I can easily imagine more than a few traditional debaters who are not just grouping contentions. Any anyone else? How about, uh, how about storytelling? Do you think that that's part of traditional debate? Really? No, just no reactions from any of you? Just literally, just pure silence. Okay. I really don't know. Like, I haven't done either. Ah. Not that much that okay, that makes, that makes sense. Um, so a lot of people, I think, again, just tend to define traditional debate in opposition to circuit debate. As in, it's speak not fast. It's don't read critiques. It's don't read theory. It's don't read these progressive arguments. I think that's silly because there is something distinct about traditional debate and the way that you approach traditional debate that is merely don't do something. It is there's something you have to do to be good at traditional debate. And hopefully, we'll discover what it is. I think that traditional debate is a style of debate that emphasizes the traditional style of LD with a particular, particular emphasis on <coughs> speaking eloquently and persuasively being accessible to a wide variety of judges, telling a persuasive story, and most importantly, a debate about the fundamental values that we hold dear, as opposed to particular instantiations of policy options or debates about abstract and like particularly difficult to grasp philosophical concepts. I think speaking about traditional debate in the positive sense, in the sense that it is, it is these things, it, as opposed to it is not these things, allows us to really get to some of the skills that we're going to need to need to have in order to be good at traditional debate. So, the best possible advice that I can give you with this sort of idea of traditional debate in mind is in order to be good at traditional debate, I think that you should follow this incredibly long sentence that I'm going to read about five times because there's no way that you can get it the first time. It is incorporate multiple independent reasons on the flow into an overarching thesis that advances a clear, concise advocacy that gets to the truth of the resolution using logical and emotional appeals. Incorporate multiple independent reasons on the flow into an overarching thesis that advances a clear, concise advocacy that gets to the truth of the resolution using logical and emotional appeals. One more time. Yeah. Incorporate multiple independent reasons on the flow into an overarching thesis that advances a clear, concise advocacy that gets to the truth of the resolution using logical and emotional appeals. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of those phrases separately and explain them. Oh, and can you say what, what's advocacy? 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 That gets to the truth of the resolution using logical and emotional appeals. Thanks. Yeah. So we're going to walk through all the steps of the statement. Then after that, we're going to get into some other things about, I think, the fundamentals of traditional or lay debate. OK, let's talk about the first part. Incorporate multiple independent reasons. What does this mean? Why do we do it? I'll take an answer to either one of those questions. Yeah? So like multiple independent reasons, so like just like different, I guess to break it down into debate terms, like different contentions, like or reasons why you should or should not do something? Yeah, so different contentions uh, basically just means, I think to me, that we have multiple reasons that are separate from one another for why you should win the rest, why you should win the debate, why you should either affirm or negate. Um, so this can mean having two separate reasons for uh, voting for the app. It can mean having separate reasons for why the criterion is correct, separate reasons for why you win, turns to the negative case, et cetera, et cetera. This doesn't mean that you just throw out a bunch of arguments and hope that they stick. It doesn't mean that you get to read utilitarianism and deontology are both simultaneously true. But it means that you have uh, several different reasons, not just one for why your side is correct. And why do we do this? Well, I think the answer is simple, and I won't ask this question because none of you will answer it, um, is that not everyone thinks like you. Uh, minimally speaking, I would guess most of your judges have not spent thousands of dollars to come to a debate camp for three weeks and waste away part of their summer in classrooms surrounded by other nerds learning about debate. So they probably don't think about debate quite as much as you do. And even if they do think about debate quite as much as you do, just think about the ideological diversity that occurs here at camp. Right, amongst intellectuals who consider themselves debate nerds, and the differing opinions that they hold about what makes an argument correct or incorrect. The, the fact is, is that even amongst these people, there's very little chance that you'll have a single argument that wins all of them over simultaneously. And amongst parent judges, or traditional judges, um, and I'll make a distinguishing, like a, I'll make a, a, like characterize the difference between parents and traditional judges uh, at the end of this, uh, lecture today, but for those types of judges who aren't necessarily skilled in the sort of debate that we learn here, or for those types of judges who don't really think about debate that much because they're parents and have lives outside of debate, thankfully, um, how do you reach them, right? We don't know because we can't think like them. For one thing, we suffer the curse of knowledge. We don't know that we know too many things. And for another thing, we just don't think like them. They have different thoughts, right? Different political views, different backgrounds, different ideologies, different conceptions of what is right and wrong. And so going for just one reason for why you're you know, winning is generally not a good idea. Remember, traditional debate is characterized by being accessible <coughs> to a wide variety of judges, which means in order to reach that wide variety, you need multiple reasons for why you should win. All right, so the next part of the statement is on the flow. Uh, why is this relevant in a world of you know, parent judges who don't flow or traditional debate judges who flow you know, horizontally instead of vertically? Um, why is this at all relevant? Well, it's because people still are logical creatures. And despite the fact that most people are terrible at flowing, debaters included, uh, having an argument on the flow is a crucial and necessary step towards debating traditionally because people who refuse to debate the flow generally lose to anyone who is more competent at flow-based debate than they are. Uh, this part should just be obvious, but the reason it's in there is because so many people hold the misconception that I don't need to win the flow to win a traditional debate round, which is just incorrect. How many times have you watched someone just not win the flow and win a debate round? And the answer is probably once or twice, but beyond that, really never. You need to have a good flow-based, good technical skills. And we're going to talk more about the technical skills uh, uh, when we talk about affirming and negating and why that's relevant, but this is just in here to make sure that none of you all get the idea that it's okay to just tell pretty stories and not touch the flow. The next part is into an overarching thesis. Uh, so just like in your English essays where you're forced to write uh, a thesis statement and follow whatever paragraph format that they want you to have, so like maybe the five sentence paragraph format where you have an intro, three body statements, uh, and a conclusion for each paragraph, um, your English papers are characterized by a thesis statement, a single statement that you will defend as sort of true uh, or that you will defend as correct throughout the, throughout the round. Um, 
And I think that's really important for people who just don't think about debate as much as we do or think about debate differently than we do. In order to make it really clear, in order to make it really uh, you know, just apparent to judges who don't think about debate or have different thoughts about debate, you need something that they can easily latch onto. Right? You need a thesis statement. And this jives pretty well with the idea of multiple independent reasons. Just like your English essays will generally contain two or three separate arguments for why your thesis statement is correct, your debate cases should ca contain multiple independent reasons or contentions for why the sort of thesis statement that you're saying is correct. Um, again, we'll talk more about this on uh, you know, the next couple of days when we read example affirmative and negative cases and we point out sort of the thesis statements and how uh, these contentions link into this idea of an overarching thesis statement. The next part is advances a clear and concise advocacy. So I know this is a little bit contradictory given how long this sentence is and how unclear and unconcise the sentence that I'm saying is, uh, but clear, concise advocacy matters in a debate round. So what is the difference between a thesis and an advocacy? Someone? Anyone? Take your best guess. I promise I won't judge, at least not that much. Yeah? Like an advocacy is like the plan that you're saying should happen. Mm -hmm. And then like the thesis is kind of like why it's like it's kind of like a combination like like the like a bunch of like reasons as to why the plan is good. Yeah, so the advocacy is what you defend. Uh, the thesis is sort of the overarching reason for why you defend that and why you think it is a good idea. Why are these things separate? Uh, separate parts of the statement, given that most of us, our advocacy is just the resolution. Well, it's because a lot of people are very unclear about what the resolution means and what it means to affirm and negate. So, for example, on this topic about human enhancement, what the heck does it mean to declare that human enhancement is immoral? Does the affirmative merely cast a moral judgment about whether or not HET or the non-therapeutic use of HETs is moral or not? Or does it take proactive steps to ban it, for instance? Does it take steps to regulate it? What does it do? These are questions that are generally left untouched in most traditional debates that makes it very difficult for the judge to pinpoint you to any given advocacy that makes it very difficult to vote for you. When the judge doesn't know what you're saying, what you're defending, it's hard to vote for you. The next part is gets to the truth of the resolution. So in circuit debate, uh, although I, again, I hesitate to sort of contrast circuit and traditional so much, in, in circuit debate, you can read whatever you want, right? There's virtually no constraint on the type of argument that you want to read. If you want to read something that says that um, unrestrained HET use for some reason collapses our economy and that affects our relations with China, which affects our ability to solve global warming, which affects global oceanic food supplies, which affects droughts in Africa, which triggers a nuclear war in Africa and kills us all, you can say that. If you want to say something along the lines of uh, let's become communists and just read a bunch of Karl Marx at people for you know seven minutes. You can do that. Um, but at, last night uh, we had a debate in which um, Rafi uh, said that the correct answer to our terrorism bad arguments was that terrorism is good because it maintained U.S. military presence in Afghanistan, which somehow solved nuclear war, even though the cards were from 2001. You can say whatever the heck you want, but that's not persuasive, right? Traditional debate is persuasive, and not just to people who do debate, but people outside of debate. And that is just not persuasive. The persuasive aspect is the truth of the resolution. The immediate idea that you would get when you hear a topic as to why it would be true or false. Why, as soon as you hear the non-therapeutic use of HETs is immoral, what is the truest argument, the intuitive gut reaction argument for why it is immoral or for why its use is immoral? Why, what is the true intuitive argument for why it is not immoral, yeah? Well, it does make sense in the sense that people are good at defending it, but it doesn't make sense in the sense that in the real world, no one would consider those real arguments. <laughs> like, circuit debate is a game, right? We can just read whatever we want. If we can defend whatever silly ideas we throw out there, then we win. Um, but traditional debate, I would characterize it as less of a game and more of a persuasive act, which is despite the fact that you might be more technically proficient than other people, uh, you probably aren't going to win every single debate where you go for uh, you know, that long, ridiculous link chain scenario that I described earlier, even if you are technically better at debate, because judges aren't going to vote for it. It is a persuasive activity. Now, 
Circuit debate is also persuasive activity, it's just persuasive in a different way, where it's persuasive as a logic game, uh, or a puzzle, or something like that. Or, whereas uh, <coughs> traditional debate is more as a persuasive game as it relates to the judge in the room and like their actual conception of how the real world works. So the truth of the resolution is just that one argument, or that two arguments, for why you think the AF and the NEG are just immediately true or immediately false. Um, and this is really important, given that despite the fact that judges think differently, that they have different ideas of how the world works, different political views, different backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. As soon as you read a topic to them, there's going to be some immediate gut reaction to why that topic is either correct or false. And that is the gut reaction you want to exploit. That is the truth of the resolution. That is the falsity of the resolution. You want to get to that immediately, because that's the easiest way to get to a judge's ballot. The final part is using logical and emotional appeals. Um, so the logic part should be obvious. Uh, if you aren't a logical person, you're probably not going to convince people in a logic-based activity about evidence, reason, and persuasion that you're correct. But the other part of that emotional appeals is also important. And we'll get to that in uh, a second. But don't ignore that people and judges are not machines. They don't listen to arguments in a vacuum, and they don't evaluate them like technical robots that play your logic puzzle game, where they reason out every single premise that you've made, and then compare the validity and strength of each of those premises relative to another premise, et cetera, et cetera. No, people or judges are humans, right? They have parts to them that they can't divorce from their logical self. There are parts to them where they will attempt to be logical and yet fail to overcome their own personal biases. And that is something you have to recognize as a debater by getting to the fact that people have both emotions and logic parts to them. And we'll talk more about this in a second. <coughs> so, <coughs> um, that's the sort of overarching stuff about lay debate fundamentals. What we're gonna do now is just go through a list of things that I think are really important to learn uh, for lay debate fundamentals or traditional debate fundamentals, and we'll talk through each of them. So the first thing is uh, ballot stories. Um, ballot stories are what? They are probably just the story of the ballot, uh, which kind of is circular uh, in, in its explanation, but I think it's one of the most important parts of debating traditionally. <coughs> so ballot stories are what the judge writes on their ballot. It's how they make a decision for the affirmative and the negative, or, or the negative, and it is really ultimately what distinguishes a good debater from a great debater. Any good debater can make arguments, can cut evidence, can read that evidence, and can sound not terrible in a round, although currently I sound terrible because I'm still sick. <clears throat> um, but no good debater, or merely good debater, has been able to effectively synthesize a debate round and its multiplicity of arguments into a single, uh, single part of any given speech that a judge can really easily understand. The part above where I talked about how having an overarching thesis uh, with multiple independent reasons I think rings true really well here. That um, at the end of the debate, there might be 40 arguments in the debate round, which is a lot for a 45 minute debate round. Um, but really, in the end, only two or three of those arguments will ever be relevant to a judge's decision. And you need to be really good at finding those last, those last couple of arguments on the flow prioritizing them for the judge, and telling how the judge how every single one of those arguments interacts. A great traditional debater is someone who can take complicated ideas, boil them down to their essence, and explain how those simple ideas now interact with other simple ideas in the round, and explain them to judges in a way that is accessible to them. Here's, I think, the metric by which you can determine if you've done that. The last 30 seconds of any of your speeches should be word for word what the judge writes on their ballot. This will never happen. You're just never gonna, it's just never gonna happen. But it is the metric by which you should hold yourself to. The more that a judge's ballot looks like the last 30 seconds of your second negative rebuttal, or the last 30 seconds of your second affirmative rebuttal, the better you are at composing ballot stories. I voted affirmative because the non-therapeutic use of HETs it creates massive inequality between the rich and the poor. The negative will say that uh, that prices will get cheaper over time, but that is not the case because of ex explanation that the affirmative offered. This is the most important impact in the round because the affirmative has won the framework debate, which means that the only thing we care about is reducing inequalities. The negatives arguments are unpersuasive for X, Y, and Z reasons. That might, in fact, be word for word what a judge writes on their ballot, although given that most parents write um, like two words on the ballot, maybe that won't happen. But for any given relative comp relatively competent judge, 
That's the standard you should hold yourself to. The last 30 seconds being what the judge writes verbatim on their flow. All right, the next part is about choosing powerful rhetoric. So one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that traditional debate is characterized by persuasive speaking, which means that you need to pick words that convey powerful ideas and emotions and logic and reason, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm assuming you've all heard of the concept of logos, pathos, ethos. This is an idea that shouldn't just be in your English essays, but you should carry through to your debate. So the logo stuff is easy. Be logical, right? Um, people are persuaded by being logical uh, and persuaded by people who have done work, people who have evidence, people who don't just randomly assert things, people who are, in fact, well-read and informed individuals in their community that will likely become upstanding citizens in the future. That's obvious. I don't really need to explain that part to you. All of you are here at debate camp because you are clearly logical enough to realize that debate camp will help you get better at the logic part of debate. The other two parts, however, are the interesting components of traditional debate that I think are vastly uh, underutilized, that are not considered enough. So the first part is pathos. And what is pathos? Yeah. Uh, yes, so the pathos part is the appeal to emotion. Um, this is the part that I was talking about earlier that we would get to. So remember, judges are not machines. They have emotional aspects to them, and every argument on any given topic has some personal connection to a judge. And our goal is to find the personal connection to that judge and exploit it and make it relevant to them. Think about any given parent judge at a tournament and how little they care about being there. Think about the bus driver who has just been randomly recruited to judge some rounds to fulfill school's judging obligation, or a parent who might be kind of interested in what their child does as an after-hours activity at school, but really would rather just be at home watching TV. They're not gonna care about human enhancement technology, right? Not in a general sense. If, only, if your only arguments are about like super soldiers and like random cyborg and this like awesome, cool prosthetic technology, it's interesting. Maybe the first debate they'll be interested, but post that, your logical reasoning and evidence is boring, right? It is not relevant to the judge. They're gonna tune out. They're not gonna pay attention. But that's your fault. Debate is a persuasive activity, and we need to find the way to persuade judges who are otherwise uninterested and do not care how to make this relevant to them. And the easiest way is emotional connections, right? People are, for some reason, empathetic creatures. Some say it's evolution. I say it's a weakness, whatever. Um, that they are empathetic and care about other people and they have strong connections to them. And most importantly, about, more importantly than caring about other people, they care about themselves. Anything that personally affects them is a reason for them to get involved. Think about how many politicians have to make messages entirely about you, the voter, you individually, the voter, before anyone does anything, right? If someone is, the message is, we need more school bonds, right? We need more funding for our schools. And the only argument is, think about the children. How many people come out and vote for taxes? No one, no one comes out and votes. If the argument is our city's economic progress will decline as students are unable to succeed and it will make our city look bad and it will make your wages go down and it will make your entire life worse, people come out, right? It's about making it relevant to the person, the voter, the judge, right? The person who you're trying to persuade. And that's the problem. Most people don't do that. Most people are just like, my first voting issue is that um, HETs cause inequality, and that's bad. And to them, who cares, right? We need to take it the extra step further. Why does that inequality matter to random Joe Schmo in the back of the debate room? Why does it matter to bus driver Bill, who is sitting there? Why does it matter? Well, I think it's pretty easy to make an argument for why inequalities and HETs matter. Think about your life now, judge. Well, you don't want to say this, but basically, think about your life now and how un fair it is that there are literally billionaires out there getting tax breaks who are able to fund every single part of their lives, never worry about taxes, never worry about going into debt, never worry about any of this. Think about the massive amounts of economic inequality while you struggle to make a living. And imagine if they could biologically enhance themselves to be even better than you. That sucks, right? Making that inequality argument relevant to any given person about how inequality impacts them and their daily lives. And how this isn't a fantasy, how HETs are coming now, how there are Technology, enhan technology enhancements that rich people are exploiting for their benefit right now and how that affects the judge in the back of the room right now is the only way to make judges who are uninterested or even uninformed care, right? How many pol political ads are entirely not about disseminating information but entirely about g welling up some emotion, emotional state within you? It's just like, 
be patriotic. Do your duty and vote for, I don't know, whatever bill that you decide to think is, is good or whatever. It's, it's not about the facts at this point, although the facts are relevant. It's, it's entirely about getting you to believe you because of an emotional reason that affects you, right? And that's the part that people forget. Now, am I saying to oversaturate your uh, lay debate speeches or your traditional debate speeches with a bunch of random emotional appeals? No, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. But am I saying that you should recognize the importance of emotional appeals in judges? Yes, absolutely. You need to do this. This needs to be part of your last rebuttal. Making all of the technical, logical, evidence-based arguments in the first couple of speeches relevant to the judge then. Uh, so the debater that I um, coached at Nationals two years ago uh, ended up reading an affirmative case on the immigration topic, and one of his concluding remarks as the affirmative was about how he himself was an immigrant who immigrated from some random Asian country, I can't forget, I remember where, um, and how uh, immigration had to be considered a human right because without it, he would not be able to be there debating right now, and that it was unfair that people he knew as a small child are stuck in sort of conditions of poverty merely because they were unlucky to be, be born in a country without as much economic progress as the United States, and how incredibly lucky he was to get adopted, but it shouldn't rely on luck whether or not you manage to have a life that is you know, fulfilling and full of you know, happiness and joy and not full of poverty, starvation, and suffering, and how that generated a human right to immigration. And that's a much more persuasive argument than there is an intrinsic right to the freedom of movement and then read some like hot cards or something like that. That's it's not as persuasive. Only one of those really got judges moved. And in close debates, it's what tipped the scales in his favor. Uh, I remember one moment where I was like particularly proud that he made a judge cry because the judge came up to him afterwards and was like, that was a really emotional and telling story. And I was like, that kid is so unemotional. How did he make her cry? Um, so whatever, but it, it, it works. So emotional appeals, you need to really care about the pathos. But I don't even think the pathos is the most important part. Uh, actually, I think the ethos side is actually more important as a persuasive mechanism. So what is ethos then? Yeah. Appeal to credibility? Yes, appeal to credibility. And I think this is the most important part that people forget. Um, arguments are not arguments in a vacuum. They resonate strongly with the judge uh, based off of the person who is delivering that, uh, who's delivering that argument. Um, How many times uh, have so has someone that you hated given an idea that is good and you hated merely because it came from that person that you hated? Yes, right? Um, you might just be better than the rest of us if you're, not, if you're not like that. But it's totally true, right? The idea is not, cannot be really divorced from the speaker. Um, and at the end of the debate, the judge likes to think that they're voting for an argument, but most judges are not voting for an argument. They're voting for a person. They are voting for a speaker. They are voting for the debater, right? And they need to want to vote for you. They need to feel good about voting for you. They need to know that you are credible to sell their ideas. So there, I think there are two aspects to the ethos you side. The first is sort of like you as a person need to be credible, right? Um, you need to demonstrate that you care about this activity. You need to demonstrate that you are well-researched. You need to demonstrate that you are sort of the model idea of a debater, right? When someone thinks debater on stage at nationals or debater on stage at state or debater even on stage in the finals of this tournament, what do they need to think? They need to think you, right? They need to think this is the most credible person in the room. This is the person I want to vote for, right? This is the person that has clearly been the most researched. This is clearly the person who did the most work. This is clearly the person who is the most knowledgeable, the most intelligent. They need to think all these positive qualities about you. They need to feel good about voting for you. Yeah, do you have a question or are you just, okay. Right, they need, to, they need that to themselves. You, who, no one wants to vote for the uncredible person. No one wants to vote for the person who shows up in sloppy clothes. Uh, no one wants to vote for the person who can't speak articulately, um, who can't speak well, who doesn't have like a good vocabulary. No one wants to vote for the person who clearly has done no work. No one vote, wants to vote for the person who doesn't care. No one wants to vote for any of those people. And you need to sell the exact opposite, right? You need to sell that you are the debater, right? You are the most credible person in the room. You will believe everything that I say because I'm credible enough to say it, and I'm clearly the most qualified person in the room to say it. I'm more knowledgeable than you about the topic. I'm more knowledgeable than you about the topic. But don't worry. In the end, I'm also still the best person in the room. And this is the other part to credibility, that independent of being a good debater, you need to be a good person, um, which was hard for me for a multiplicity of reasons. But at the very least, you need to fake being a good person. You need to be able 
you, someone needs to be able to look at you in the cafeteria and say, I want them to win. Not merely because you did the research, you, you're hardworking, you're smart, whatever, right? There are lots of like basically douchebags who are like that. No one wants to vote for them either. You need to be good people, humble, caring, kind, social, or at the very least, you know, not antisocial. Um, you need to be what someone would consider a model debater. And here's the judge psychology reason for that. When a traditional debate coach, you know, who only coaches traditional debate for their entire lives, looks at you in the back of the room, they want to say that you are the model of what they have been working for their entire lives, right? They represent an activity of traditional debate that they have, you know, effectively resisted the incomingness of, like, you know, the incoming assault of circuit debaters. They need to say that their activity means something, that they've made a difference in kids' lives, and that it's an activity that still gives them hope and joy. They need to think this is worth something, right? Because, I mean, after your third, fourth year of judging, like, I'm already kind of just like, oh man, debate kind of sucks sometimes. And imagine being here 20 years into coaching, and you're just watching some awful rounds from some awful debaters, and you're just like, I don't care anymore. Um, you need to be the person that is like, no, 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 I'm a good person. I represent basically everything that you want out of this activity, right? I, when you, when you vote for me, you should feel good about it. You should feel like you are voting for someone who deserves it, not only as a debater, but as a person. Think about it from the perspective of parents, right? They're there because they're, I assume their kids do speech and debate, and their kid probably does way too much speech and debate. They probably spend way too much time on this activity because otherwise they wouldn't have roped their parents into this. And think about their parent rooting for their child, and they're like, man, my child does so much work, I hope they win the tournament. I really want my kid to do well. And they need to still look at you and go, yeah, I'm okay if my kid loses to them, right? They need to be okay with that as well. You want to really have to, really to be good at traditional debate. You need to control every aspect about yourself, at least at a tournament, to sell that you are the better debater and the better person. And none of this is at all related to, you know, actual in-round conduct, because that's like a lot of the, or like in-round, sorry, debate skills, right? Um, it's mostly just in-round conduct. Speaking well, being pr like nicely presented, you know, not swaying a bunch when you speak like I've been doing, or using unnecessary hand gestures, just being nice in the cafeteria, not trashing other opponents, not trashing judges. No one should ever get a bad feeling about voting for you. Okay, so that's that long spiel over. I think it's really important though, because I think um, once people figure this out, it becomes a lot easier to win tournaments. Because sometimes, honestly speaking, judges have no idea how to vote. They're literally unqualified to make a decision, and that's just a fact. There are some parents who should not be making decisions because they're just obviously biased or they're just obviously incapable of making a decision. Um, that's fine. But it's still your, your job to persuade them, right? The average, I, I remember some like Winston Churchill quote about like the best case against democracy is like a five minute conversation with your average voter or something like that. Um, I think the best case against debate uh, as an activity is the five minute conversation with your average judge. Um, but at the same time, uh, just like in a democracy, it's your job to get people to vote for you. And you have to realize that at the end of the, of the day, it may not be Logos that wins you the debate. It might sometimes just be you being a slightly more pathosy or slightly more ethosy person. But that's, up, but that's on you. Okay. So that's the powerful rhetoric stuff um, and the sort of emotional appeals and ethosy stuff. Uh, let's talk about speaking in round. Um, so not only do your words need to be emotionally laden with like a bunch of baggage, right? Uh, it needs to be intelligible, it needs to be clear and articulate, um, because again, this sort of ties into the aspect of you being a good debater, which means being a good communicator and a good speaker. If you are speaking too fast, if you are not, if you are monotone the entire time and have zero inflection in your voice and no one wants to listen to what you're saying because you're boring, or if you curse a bunch during your debates or whatever, don't do that. Um, I think the best way to get better at speaking generally is to do a speech event. I recommend extemporaneous speaking. Not only does it improve your knowledge of the world or American politics or et cetera, which means that you'll just become a better educated person overall, um, you get better at uh, speaking to um, non-educated judges because you have to inform them about the world in, in a seven minute speech. Uh, but also you get better at BSing as well. That's just a good side effect of extemporaneous speaking. Um, but you need to do a speech activity of some sort. You need to get better at speaking. You can't hope to get good at circuit tradi or sorry traditional debate if you are not a good speaker. Um, my debaters would sometimes read poetry in order to get good at speaking, and so they could pick words with like interesting syntax and like um, like and word choice and whatever. I don't really know if that works, but maybe it works for you. Um, cool. The we'll talk a little bit about judge psychology for the next couple of minutes. Okay. 
Um, so not only did I talk, sort of talk about judge psychology earlier and the sort of how to persuade judges to the ethos and pathos stuff, but there's a bunch of things that you want to do to make it easier to vote for you from a psychological perspective. The first is just be on the side of intuition. Be on the side of, uh, be on the side of right, or at least apparently right. This gets back to the truth of the resolution stuff, but the psychological reason for this is simple. People are tired when they judge a debate term. It is mentally straining to hear 14 year olds yell at you about what morality is and HETs are for a couple of hours a day. It's 10 p.m. at night. Literally no one wants to hear your voice. Your voice probably sounds terrible just like mine does. No one wants to listen to it. So everything that you can do to decrease cognitive strain on the judge is an easy way to win the debate, right? Judges are always looking for the easiest way out of the round, the whatever decreases their cognitive strain. No judge is like, yes, I got to sit in the back of this room for 30 minutes making a decision. This has never happened once in the history of traditional debate. Instead, judges are like, yeah, that debate was really clear. They just made it super easy for me. I voted for the egg and I left the room within 30 seconds. You're done. Reducing cognitive strain is the ultimate goal of, uh, of making debates easier from a psychological perspective. So simpler language reduces cognitive strain. So if all you like to do is say giant words from the postmodern generator, you're doing it wrong. Um, if you, uh, and making, uh, making a good ballot story like I talked about earlier reduces cognitive strain. Uh, and actually, surprisingly, repetition reduces cognitive strain. The more that you tell someone something, the more likely they are to believe it. That's why in the ethos section about, or about section about ethos, I just said this stuff over and over and over because at first you might have been skeptical, but I just kept on saying it over and over and over and eventually you all believed me or at least, you know, kind of believed me. And it works, just telling someone over and over and over again uh, without being too repetitive is an easy way to reduce cognitive strain because just like there are common catchphrases in the world that are totally spoken incorrectly, uh, you still believe that they are true because you've just heard them so many times. Um, so, you know, the famous Star Wars quote, Luke, I am your father, is actually super misquoted, but everyone assumes that it's correct because they've heard it so many times. Just repetition is drilled into their brain that it's correct. It's actually, no, I am your father. Um, just a little tidbit for you if you want to quote Star Wars in the future. Um, but yeah. And finally, is about psychology and cognitive strain, is making your message memorable, right? Uh, I don't care what you do to make your message memorable, but something needs to stick out to the judge at the end of the debate. They need to, three days from now, after they've gone back to their real life job of teaching English or driving the bus or being a doctor if they're a, if they're a parent or whatever, they, there needs to be something memorable about you, right? A catchphrase of yours, of like, you know, maybe some like really eloquent phrase. I remember that I lost states my junior year to the person who won NSDA nationals in 2015 because he had this like excellent memorable phrase something along the lines of um, how many innocents will you sacrifice upon the altar of moral purity before you recognize that the affirmative is a moral atrocity or something like that I have no idea exactly what it was but basically I remember listening to that and still three four years later I'm just like dang that was a good quote and I lost that debate but also I, I lost it for other reasons but like at the end of the debate, that was the quote that everyone was talking about, right? It wasn't anything that I said. I didn't have anything memorable. That was my fault. He had something memorable, something that was really good, something that was easy to latch onto, something that reduced cognitive strength, something that made it really easy for the judge to vote for them. Um, and another way to make your message memorable is just like verse and like rhymes and stuff. Like you all remember, like you'll all remember the phrase woes unite foes better than woes unite enemies. Like one of those is just clearly better. All right. The next part is perceptual dominance. And I'm sure all of you have heard this term before, but I think it bears repeating in the context of traditional debate. Traditional debate is about perceptual dominance. And everything that I've talked about so far only leads into a concept of perceptual dominance. The only reason you want to use solid emotional appeals is to be more perceptually dominant in the round and to appeal better to the judge. The only reason you want to be more ethosy and more credible as a debater and as a person is because you get to have perceptual dominance if that's the case. Right? So perceptual dominance is controlling the round. It is being the person that the judge is only kind of listening to and still thinks, yep, that person's winning. They look in the room. Someone looks through the window and they're like, yep, that person's winning. Perceptual dominance is that unspoken, like hard to pinpoint exactly what it is effect that just leads someone to think they are a good debater and they are definitively winning this round. I don't know what characteristics make some, someone perceptually dominant. And in fact, I don't even think there is a single set of characteristics that makes anyone perceptually dominant. I've seen debaters who are perceptually dominant, who are incredibly soft-spoken, who are, who are not emotional at all, who are merely logic machines, but they are so good at being logic machines, they just are clearly going to win the round, and they're just going to take no BS from you, and they're just going to win anyways. 
I've seen perceptually dominant debaters who are uh, only emotional speakers, right? They're just perceptually dominant because they're so good at connecting complicated ideas to core emotional concepts that you hold dear, like you know, not being in poverty and stuff like that. Right? They're so good at just making it relevant to the judge. And I've seen perceptual dominance in between. And here's the good news. Anyone can be perceptually dominant. And you have your own ways of being perceptually dominant. I don't exactly know the characteristics that made me perceptually dominant, because uh, I haven't really gone back and looked at my old rounds and stuff. But there had to have been something about me that was perceptually dominant. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been good at debate. Um, I think um, <coughs> it's up to you to sort of find what you find perceptually dominant. Um, I don't care what it is. Uh, for me, actually, I think the easiest way uh, was to watch other debaters that you found good and to emulate a lot of their practices. So for example, here are a list of debaters that I found really good and I like to emulate. I liked Danny Dubois. I thought he was incredibly technically proficient. I thought he spoke very, very well. I thought he was incredibly intelligent and he was always acting like he was in control. I liked Gabe Bronstein, the 2012 national champion. I thought he was very good at making simple, lay debate arguments accessible to a wide variety of judges. I thought he was a very eloquent speaker. I thought he had an interesting vocal inflection that I tried to emulate. So I thought he was a really good debater. I thought Josh Roberts, the 2011 national champion, was an incredibly good debater. I thought his slow-spoken Southern drawl, where he really didn't have a strong inflection in his voice, but he was just like very confident and very just in control of himself, just merely being there and not reacting to sort of a lot of external stimuli, I thought that that was very perceptually dominant because he was sure of himself. And there's a, the list goes on and on. There's tons of debaters I find really, really good at debate, uh, mostly in circuit debate, but there's also some really, really good traditional debaters that I think are just fantastic at debate. And you need to find your own models or icons or whatever, even if they're just local people who win all the tournaments, you need to find what about them is perceptually dominant. And you could, you could sort of emulate that. But, as, but even though I can't tell you exactly the trait that makes you perceptually dominant, whether it's being soft-spoken or you know, very vocal in your intonation, or whether it's um, you know, just like being very logical or whether it's being very emotional or whatever, I don't really know. The one thing that connects all of these people and their perceptual dominance together is confidence. Confidence wins everything, especially in traditional debates. I guarantee you that the vast majority of judges, even coaches, on any given traditional debate topic, do not understand the in and outs of any given philosophical position that you're reading more than you. And I guarantee you that any given judge does not more, know more about the topic than you. Half of these parent judges show up to the tournament, they walk into their first round and are like, what is the topic, right? You hopefully know more than them. And most importantly, uh, you hopefully are good at communicating it to them. But here's the fact. They're not gonna understand everything that you say. The, the fact is, is that we had to put three very, very intelligent people on the human enhancement technologies topic in order to produce that topic analysis for you um, that you watched. We had to put like a lot of mental and like mental power towards making this accessible. Uh, and these are some of the smartest people in debate right now. And yet, even you all, who I consider pretty intelligent people, had a lot of questions about this topic, right? You had access to a lot of research. You had access to a lot of staff. You had access to a lot of resources, and you're still, still not sure. And yet, there are these parents who have even less. And there's, factually speaking, they're just not going to be able to adjudicate most debate rounds in any competent sense, right? But you know what everyone's capable of doing? They're capable of saying, yeah, I think someone won, right? They're capable of looking at someone and saying, yeah, that was, I think that was a good speaker. They really convinced me, and they won't be able to cite a single reason for why you were convincing, but they really were convincing. They were really in control. And the proxy and the, and the sort of connecting feature between all of that is confidence, because confidence is an excellent proxy for skill and knowledge, right? Um, it's just fake it till you make it, and it's totally true. Um, it's because confidence is a proxy for knowledge, as I said, where when a judge is unsure what's happening in the round, they're just gonna default to who is more confident in saying it. Well, I think that um, HETs are not immoral because um, it's not a persuasive way to sell your position at all. No one wants to vote for that person for a variety of other reasons, but no one will believe anything that person says. When the judge is like, yeah, I just didn't agree with you, you know, no one is gonna be like, but why? They're just gonna be like, oh, that's understandable because you are a terrible speaker um, and you have no confidence in yourself. And I don't care if you actually have no confidence in yourself. I have zero confidence in myself. I'm terrible at life. I'm terrible at debate. But at the very least, I'm good at faking it until I make it. Um, I think it worked pretty well. Uh, and it's just about recognizing 
you know, yeah, you may be stupid, but guess what? The only other person in the room that's going to know that you're stupid is you. Uh, maybe your opponent, if they're intelligent, I doubt it. The judge is not going to realize it. Unless you're just saying blatantly terrible things like the Holocaust is good, um, you're probably going to get away with saying whatever you want, and as long as you're confident enough in saying it, the judge will vote for it. All right. Um, so, perceptual dominance is that. But why is it really sort of, uh, like, what, what does it mean? It's sort of controlling the round and forcing your will upon the round. And I think there are two aspects to the sort of control aspect of perceptual dominance. The first is sort of controlling the flow. Um, and even though the flow isn't a super important issue, uh, in the sense that uh, most debates are not decided on technical concessions on the flow or like very intricate flow interactions and whatnot, but it's important for one important reason, and that is it makes your opponent bad at debate. The, m the better you are at flow-based debate, the more technical you are, the better, the more your opponent is just going to suffer in comparison by performance, right? Um, your judge may not know that you made three turns to the affirmative contention. Uh, they don't really notice slash care. Uh, but your opponent is like, oh shoot, there are three turns to my contention, and suddenly the one AR is more rushed, and they don't sound as good. And by comparison, you sound a lot better. Controlling the flow allows you to control the direction of the debate, and most importantly, control how your opponent debates. Opponents who suffer from being the worst in terms of technical skills in the room just generally do not perform as well, not only in a technical sense, but also in a confidence sense. They're just not confident that they're going to win anymore if you are tech better at technical debate than they are which is why coming to camp is really, really important and why learning about technical type arguments like the distinction between offense and defense and like the distinction between offense, defense, and framework and about turns and, and tricky stuff like that is really, really helpful. Not because it necessarily gets judges to vote for you, although it, it can. It's because it gets opponents to debate worse. But the second part of perceptual dominance and the control part is controlling the room, controlling the round and controlling yourself. Um, and it could be as simple as just simply sounding in control, where just when the judge listens and they're not really paying attention to what the content is being said, they can close their eyes and think, yeah, clearly that aft debater is just leading around the negative debater. They just clearly are in better control of this room. They know what's going on. And what it is, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not exactly sure how to do that, but it's not that hard to watch in rounds, right? You, you clearly have observed rounds where one debater is just clearly leading the other debater around. You should be that debater, right? Um, there's also like silly tips for being good at perceptual dominance. I'm not sure how any how good any of those are. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, although we're, we're done in like five minutes, so I'm not sure if it's uh, if you want to leave now. Um, no like silly tips for perceptual dominance. Like for example, my coach recommended in the cross examination, you take one step forward closer to your judge than your opponent does, so your opponent's like behind you and so you're in front. I'm not sure if that works, but it, you, for some reason you'll see it all the time. Um, and yeah, uh, there's something else I wanted to say. Oh right, um, perceptual dominance is not a proxy. Is not only a conf or confidence is not only a proxy for information, but perceptual dominance is a proxy for decision. Most judges do not decide here's who won the or here are the arguments, here's who won them. Most people decide here's who won, here are the arguments that justify why I voted for them. Understanding this reversal and decision process that most judges have is really important because uh, it's not about winning the debate necessarily on arguments. It's just having a winning argument in the debate that the judge can vote for, right? It doesn't matter if you're better at technical debate because I've seen many around where some person was just, it was like probably noticeably ahead on the sort of technical aspect of the flow debate. But the other opponents still had an argument in the game uh, and they sounded better and they seemed more perceptually dominant and in control of the round. And in the end, the judge votes for that person. They might've been losing a little bit on the technical sense, but as long as there's some argument, some rationalization, something that they can latch onto and vote for, they'll vote for that person no matter what. And you're gonna complain, uh, you know, if you lose to this person, oh no, this was a judge screw, how dare they do this? I was clearly winning the technical debate. Where, 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 it's your fault. Clearly you need to understand how judges make decisions and adapt to that, right? Okay, uh, only two minutes left, so I'm just gonna get through the last couple of things really quickly. Um, first is that there are a few myths that I want to counter. So the first myth is that sort of judges do not vote on arguments and they vote for who sounds the best. Um, while this may sound like a truth statement based off of what I've just said 30 seconds ago, judges do vote on something. And as I explained, that something may not be what has technically won the round, but it is something that they can say justified who they vote for and why that person won the round. There's um, always a myth that lay, judge, lay debate is random and that traditional debate is random uh, and that you can't win no matter what and just people who win are just lucky. Um, 
There's some truth to that. I can't control for all of the randomness that exists in the debate world. You're gonna have to get over it, but you have to also recognize that there are techniques that you can use to just win closer rounds. If you're consistently losing close debates, there's gotta be something that you're doing that causally connects you to losing more. Someone has to win the debate, might as well be you. And the sort of general other myth is that um, if you aren't a white guy, you're probably not gonna do super well at traditional debate. Um, and unfortunately, there is a sad truth to that argument, given that um, traditional debate is just so white guy dominated. Oh, so white guy dominated. But um, there are techniques that, you know, if you aren't a guy, you can use to be perceptually dominant. And there are techniques that if you aren't white, you can use to be perceptually dominant. Uh, I don't really know what those are. I just tried to emulate as much of a white guy as I could and see how well that worked. And I think it worked pretty well. Uh, but for other people, that's just not necessarily a possibility. And you have to recognize that there are differences that judges have because they have their biases, whether or not they're explicit or implicit, and because of you know just the way that people have been socialized to think, right? Like that women for some reason have to be softer spoken. If they're aggressive, they're just like you know whatever offensive word you want to insert there, and you have to sort of overcome some of those stereotypes. And it's just it is just factually a lot easier to be good at traditional debate if you are um, a white male. But the fact is is that. There have been people that have been successful, um, even without sort of conforming to what we would consider traditional like white male debate techniques. And it is possible to get good at debate without having those techniques on hand, um, and, and uh, sorry, without having those advantages on hand. It's possible to still win anyways. Uh, and it's and you know, I don't really know exactly what those are for some people because I'm not those people, but it exists. All right, so that's the end of today. I think today we covered sort of just the basics of lay debate and sort of some ways of thinking about judge decision making and some ways that you can be more persuasive to a wide variety of judges. Again, tomorrow we'll talk about how to affirm in traditional debates and finally we'll talk about how to negate. Thank you. All right. Thank you.